Welcome to Cartoonist Cafe. My name is Jim Rugg. I'm Ed Piscor. First, let's plug a couple of our projects. I have a Kickstarter up right now for Octobriana 1976, the world's first blacklight comic book, and it is available for a short time. So if you want it, now is the time to jump on it, the underground Russian superhero Octobriana. And if you are watching this a day or two after the Kickstarter's uh, lapsed or whatever, the books are probably in the midst of being uh, printed as we speak, man. Right now, I'm also uh, serializing my comic, Red Room, on uh, on my Patreon, patreon.com slash edpiscor. Outlaw comics in the grand tradition of, like, Faust, The Crow, Super Bloody, Super Violent, uh, Snuff. Nightmare Comic. This is a, uh, a self-published series that came out of California in the 90s by Lawrence Hubbard and H.P. McElwee, uh, also known as Raw Dog and R.D. Bone. Yes, sir. Um, this is kind of a... This was a bit of a mythic comic book for me. So I had been doing aphrodisiac, and I was at San Diego, and on Sunday there, uh, a friend of mine, Dylan Williams, who knows indie comics, was like, hey, do you know Real Deal? And I didn't. This is the first time I'd heard of it. And so these guys had exhibited, or at least Lawrence Hubbard had exhibited at San Diego with Real Deal in the past. That's how I think Dylan knew about it. And I spent all day looking for this comic unsuccessfully and came home thinking maybe he was pulling my leg. But over the next year, I was able to track these things down. And uh, it's a series of comics that are self-published, at least until recently. And uh, we'll go through and kind of look at a sample of these, talk about the stories and artists a little bit, and get into uh, their, their big book that has come out since the self-publishing days. So starting out, uh, this is the first issue, and you'll notice it's oversized, 11 by 17, kind of awesome for that reason, you know, I, I like this kind of big oversized comic, printed on newsprint, cover in color with like marker art, and the cover is by Lawrence Hubbard, uh, Raw Dog, who still continues to produce Real Deal and who you can follow online and see his art and stuff there. Um, but let's uh, let's dive into it. Yeah, man, I love the color of the uh, marker color on that cover. This, Urban Terror. Yes, setting the tone. So, what is Urban Terror? And they go through and they kind of explain this. This was uh, published in 1989. Again, self-published by these guys out of Los Angeles. Urban Terror is a humorous essay of the violence that occurs every day in the urban centers of America. And so, this kind of, you know, he talks about having a slight bit of levity. And whenever you read interviews about kind of the reception of the work, that's something that comes up. Um, these are fascinating comics. They're raw. They're edgy. I love the artwork. It kind of reminds me a little bit of a Gary Panther. You know, it has a, an outsider quality. It has a, I don't want to say naive exactly, because I think the figure works really strong. But if you look at kind of the line work and stuff, it has a rough quality that really says outsider art, which I think can add to a comic that doesn't, you know, this is not your regular comic book story. And I think this art accentuates that. I got these, uh, I got the first two issues from uh, a local guy, you know, started having babies and needed space in his house and, and, and gave gave me, you know, a bunch of his comics. He got them from uh, Grand Royal Magazine, the, the Beastie Boys mag. Yes. I, I guess it was mentioned or something uh, in the pages there. But when I got these things, amazing documents, because there was nothing that I could find online about uh, the creators. So it felt like uh, psychotic comics, you know what I'm saying? Yes. Like, I, I think I probably got them before I discovered Ben Mara's work. And I mythologized this shit. No comics are quite like this. This first story, there are several, this is like an anthology, I think there are three stories in this first issue. The first one is called Our Team, and it's basically like a hardcore A-team. Yeah. Uh, a bunch of ass kickers that have, I guess, a military past, but some guy that owes them money, they just stomp the shit out of. And then we see, like, our team headquarters throwing dudes off the roof. And when somebody shows up knocking, they open the door with bazookas and machine guns. And then just yank them in, boy. <laughs> yank him in and tie him to a chair and uh, start interrogating what he's after. This character, his name is Ugg. <laughs> and it's good shit, too, man. Some little little rich boy can't can't handle his own business, man, so he's trying to get some hit men. And they're like, man, there ain't no money in that, $15,000. But then they get that, the bright idea that, oh, man, wherever we're about to go, 
I guess it's like some some uh, mafia dudes. Mafia's trying to infiltrate the local union, and so this dude wants to get rid of those mafia dudes. Uh, they decide that fifteen thousand dollars is a joke, but if they hit those mafia dudes, it's the mafia. They'll have some money too, so they'll get they'll get paid that direction also. Yeah, and then it's a little unclear, but like. When they make that decision, then they just cut that boy up a lot. Is that what I'm looking at right there? Yeah, I think they kill him. Because <laughs> they say, uh, okay, kid, let's have the details. And then he says, the usual, Ugg. And uh, that's it. <laughs> <laughs> what are we going to do about him, Sarge? The usual, Ugg. See, I, I bet um, Tarantino might have been a real deal reader before Reservoir Dogs. <laughs> might have been. I love this panel. Like, uh, you know, I was saying it has this outsider quality, and a lot of that's in the to- like in the tools, I think, that are used. If you look at the marks, it almost looks like, I don't know, some ballpoint pen or a uniball pen or something like that. But the drawing's badass. Like, that helicopter flying over the street, pretty awesome panel, especially middle of the page, fantastic. I dig this one. This, this was one of my favorite strips when I first started reading Real Deal because it is like that paramilitary A-team-like unit. Um, so... <laughs> This is the real deal uh, uh, humor. So we go in and the Mafia Don wants one of these uh, cocktail bimbo- bimbos to give him some skull. And so his goons... and, then, and then, by the way, like with the asterisk, skull <laughs> equals head. So it's like... Footnote. It's like two colloquialisms, yes. man. <laughs> it should have like, you know, Ed. It should be like the editor note, like in a Marvel comic. So the goons bring in a cocktail waitress and whenever she puts up a front, they punch her in the face. But before they can really do anything... We cut back to the R team as landing. So we hate the, the mafia guys. They've got it coming. They're obviously terrible people or whatever. But like, what is going on? There aren't other comics that. There just aren't other comics like Real Deal. No. The helicopter lands and it's very funny. It's landing in like this lot and taking up four spots. I don't know why that makes me laugh, but it does. It's such a strange like observation. And uh, get in a fight with the guy who's tending the parking lot. Uh, on their way to go confront this mafia family, first uh, they got a got a fight with the parking lot attendant, and of course stomp him because that's what they do. Yeah. All right, man. That's your first eight pages. This is like Marvel Comics presents with their eight page story. <laughs> <laughs> uh, Planet Dregs is another story that runs through several of these issues. This is a uh, like a science fiction. It's a milit- It's a prison planet. All these stories sort of make sense, you know, in terms of like a genre that they're or a short story type thing that they're lampooning. You look at stuff like this, and and there are like that Adult Swim shit, like Super Jail and shit like yes. that. Like, like these guys were were doing stuff like this, fucking thirty years before that that shit came out. One of the people that I see promote a lot of uh, real deal stuff online is Johnny Ryan, who yeah. I associate with some of that like Super Jail kind of stuff. I don't know if he had anything to do with it, but I think of his comics like Prison Pit certainly being connected to that kind of uh, humor and, and approach. Yeah, Johnny Ryan definitely sort of like revitalized uh, the, the the brand of Real Deal because there is a there is a 10-year gulf between like issue 6 and 7. Yeah. All right, so Prison Planet is just a planet where prisoners get dumped. It's There aren't any rules. It's not like a compound or anything. And so you see like the cyborg survivors that have uh, made it there. It's, you know, it's a, a wasteland, a post-apocalyptic style wasteland. This guy's like a, a Ravager or something out of the X-Men. Great but designs. <laughs> just crazy, man. A broken sword, but better than nothing. And just because the audience will correct you, it was Reavers. Jimmy just, was just talking. You said Ravager? Ah. Uh, I, I just want to save a couple keyboard clicks, man. <laughs> Thanks, Ed. <laughs> Look at this, dude. It's like, it's not even furry shit. It's beyond fur, furry fandom. This is kind of a great strip because we've seen like the robot guy who delivers the prisoners here, and now we're seeing like these aliens, not quite furries, two like the two eyeballed alien with the sharp teeth, and then cyborg stuff everywhere. Pretty fun. This this strip, as the uh, series progresses, a different artist takes over the strip. Unfortunately, because I mean I like Lawrence Hubbard's art a lot, so I'd probably read anything that he was drawing, and. Uh, I definitely prefer the strips that he draws. That's what I come for. After I get this first issue, that's that's what I'm here for, what I'm looking for. Look at that, man. Before Total Recall. <laughs> <laughs> he does these like, little pulls of, of black that... Those are like the, the sort of staples of uh, of the Hubbard style, you know? 
Do you think that's a marker? That he's coming in with like a thick marker? Oh, I have no idea. Yeah, it's hard to tell. You know, just these little chunks. Although you can find original art of his. There's some in that Glenn Bray collection. Yeah, yeah. I was talking with Johnny Ryan recently, and, and he said that um, that Glenn Bray was, like, hanging out and, and scooping up real deal stuff, like, way, like, when this shit was coming out, man. So, once it makes again, sense. he's that guy, you know? they're out of California, and they definitely exhibited at San Diego. So, yeah. I'm sure Glenn Bray probably was on, you know, going to San Diego at the time and probably saw it with his good eye. But look how good the drawings are. You know, it is, it is like, a weird finished style, but the actual drawings are great. Like, the figures are all sound. It's strong work. And then, this is the third ongoing piece and this is gc yeah, yeah this is like the cover feature always yeah i think this is probably the fee i don't know if they got the best feedback or what but it seems like this feature kind of takes over look at that just bodies underneath yeah it's, it's dark a side street hollywood 4 a.m and it's a car trying to pick up this this uh hooker and whenever she refuses basically they kill her and then the pimp shows up yeah it's it's i mean we got to make note because there's a callback later because they're, they're the way they solve things is just just push something over on top of someone's head. <laughs> yeah, now they now they owe a pimp because that was, you know, that was their best hooker or whatever. Yeah. And also a lot of these stories are just like escalation, like something starts and it just it just cascades out of control. This is like a great kind of California neighborhood kind of image right here man you know it's got it's got like those one decker houses that kind of tile whatever is that spanish tile roof yeah something i don't know what the name of it is but i it, it is a tiled roof like that yeah that's like terracotta or something mm -hmm. yeah by the way this is them getting home after uh their rough night on the street or whatever and then getting into a shootout <laughs> It's so over the top. So this is issue one, and he's going to talk about, there's a book that Fanographics puts out, has an interview, and so they go through and they talk about some of the process of making this, and he explains like the size of this and everything, because self-publishing, like everybody that self-publishes, that first comic, you learn a lot yeah, about yeah. size and, and all those things. Yeah, but you know what? They were taking advantage of, because well, like, like in the interview, they said that, uh, you know, they show up to a printer... And uh, the printer's like, oh, no, we can't reduce that. We can't do... It's 11 by 17. Like, it's a regular comic. Like, they did everything right. And the fucking printer said that we can't reduce it. They they took their money. They fucked, the, they fucked them over. They did, but man, do I love this edition. I do, I do too. <laughs> I do too. But but it's like, you know, their own dollars were at stake. And that's, that's jive. Yes, I agree with you, Ed. No doubt about it. Um, this is subsequent issues like magazine size. And so maybe that's the, the issue that they had in terms of the printer, because that's the other thing that you see when people self-publish is often the books are weird sizes. Even if it's more or less comic book size, it'll be like a quarter of an inch wider than a regular comic book. You see it a million times with like 80s black and white books. Yeah. And so, you know, maybe this is what they had, the printer had in mind, you know, if it's not a comic book printer and this wouldn't quite fit, you know, you'd have weird margins, but. <laughs> you know, you got the, you got the violence, you got the brutality. And then you just add like a little, a little guy too. It's just like like Hubbard is great at that, you yeah. know. Man, I like all this stuff. All the choices with like sound effects and things. It's such an aesthetic, like it it all fits so well. You know, it almost looks like, I don't know, like you're you you can't do better lettering or something. But I don't know that that's the case. I feel like it fits perfectly with oh, this yeah. aesthetic. Yeah, yeah, like they uh. There's no self-consciousness to this shit, man. So this is kind of cool. 1993. We talk about 93 as being this big year for, you know, comics and stuff. Sad I didn't get hold of this in 1993. Four but years. pretty awesome. Four years after issue one. All right. So you see GC is now in the lead role here. Yes. And uh, basically going through uh, the usual madness. And this is the uh, issue, like, where there's innovation, just in terms of construction. Not, I'm not even talking about the art part, but, like, the ads that are in this thing. Uh, Look at the violence, though, man. You talked about, like, you know, the solid blacks and, and filling in the blacks. Just becoming the blood flying everywhere and splattered on the walls. Yeah, like, that's the thing. Like, the, like in 
his outfit, like those like black strokes, like see as textures, they're all over. But like he made it like a feature of his main character. Weird panel layouts too, the way they are like jagged edges, how they all fit together. Yeah, some of that is a little golden age-ish, like there would be stuff like that. It's, it's just so over the top. <laughs> Vomiting in the toilet, very graphically. Yeah, this is the shit, right? So it's like they went to local California businesses got a couple of dollars man to like for the they, like this is this is kickstarter you know for pre-internet i a lot of uh independent comics come come past our our uh desk very few of them have stuff like this it's so bizarre like priority appraisals this is probably somebody who works here or a friend works here or something to be able to sell an ad and then it's next to Clan Busters of America, a t-shirt from Rockville, Indiana. Like, what is this stuff? Higher math? It's it's so... Uh... There's some good ones in here, man. There, there's one that's like such a scam. It, it says the word free so, so much, but you got to send 1995 <laughs> to the address to get the access to the free shit. We're back to uh, the, the planet Dregs. And look at some of these aliens, man. This thing with like two different faces and then a bug. Just rolling up to the bar there. Are you saying this one is not Lawrence Hubbard? No, this is still him. Okay, I was going to say. Yeah, it trails off in, in future issues, but this is good stuff. Like the bug bug eyes for this creature. I like the uh, straight edge ruled word balloons. That yeah. feels a little bit golden agey and a little bit Fletcher Hanks or something. You know, just a little bit different. It, it's... Easy to read, it makes sense, but it has a special flavor to it. All right, and now we're cutting back to our team. And actually, I may have missed the our team splash page. Our team, part two. So they finished uh, out in the parking lot, and now they're heading into the mafia dinner. He's getting thicker tools, and I bet I bet he's drawing smaller. That could be, yeah. Uh, so it's size a, correction. Yeah. That's a pretty good drawing. Yeah. The beret, green beret guy with his machine gun. <laughs> now they're inside, just dude strung up, torturing him. <laughs> Legs cut off. It's... You know I love that shit, man. <laughs> the little severed head. Are we seeing sodomy here with the gun? That's some Qaddafi shit. Dark. Working the big machine gun out of the helicopter. You gotta do that. That's how you cut down a bunch of dudes. You gotta do that, man, in a post rambo world. How much does this feel like toys or something? You know, like little action figures. Yeah. Yeah, like the way he builds figures is 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 that way. And see those those um little black kind of ticks, it works good for like the camo too. You know, so so just in pedestrian scenes like it's it's a part of his art, but it also gets incorporated into the design of shit. Man, that's awesome. And so here they're they're leaving with uh basically a pile of cocaine and whatever they could find from this from this takeover. It's a good uh street value. Clothing ad. And then this was the ad that I always loved. I actually ran this in the BW zine, the black and white comic scene. Um this is Power Bear, who this is all we ever get of pa Power Bear, but I love this ad, and it felt like this would keep in line with the, uh, I don't know, the different genre movies that they were doing. It's almost Billy Jack-like Yeah, or something. Billy Jack, exactly, um, but filtered through the real deal guys. Would have been cool, man. I would have liked to have seen some Power Bear comics. Here's the one, dude. Free <laughs> food, merchandise, services, vacations, not junk. National Directory of, National Directory of Freebies contains... Ba 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 ba. Send nineteen ninety nine <laughs> to Jay Pryor, and it's just the person's name. It's it's ridiculous. <laughs> trying to see if there's any other really good ones here. There's underground rap, unreleased records from unknown artists, CD ROMs, thousand titles, action games, sex adult graphics. <laughs> That was that era, man, where you had to put that phone receiver down on that little acoustic coupler. And I feel like a version of this ad has been around since advertising started. Make $1,000 a day now. <laughs> it sounds too good to be true. Yeah, shocking. They would always do the wraparound covers, too, and it was always really great. Uh, just seeing his art in color with that, that kind of marker color. Look at that little rat. Yeah, that's sad. Peeing in the cooler. <laughs> so 
Here are some of the other issues. Just kind of flip, flipping uh, through, show you what's available. And they've done, I believe, eight issues have been published so far. They're all kind of this magazine format after that first issue. And then if you're looking, if you if you want to get some real deal, the best place I would say is this book. This yeah. is a collection of real deal that Fanographics published relatively recently. I think it's still in print and available and a beautifully designed book. Jacob Covey is the designer. So you get some of this color art and nice reproductions, uh, really like, you know, artist edition style, high quality scans and full size or bigger. So you can really see the artwork. Um, love some of the lettering choices. And then we have the table of contents, including a nice intro by uh, Lawrence Hubbard. Look at how well this is designed, huh? Yeah, I love all, again, I love this lettering. This is like that paste up kind of rub off lettering, you know, like early typeset kind of lettering, pre-digital. Pre and they even have like the variations of the bold, but also the outline versions. Yep. And then just the paste ups, like all kind of like they really oh, damn near a ransom note. Yeah, pretty cool. They even vary the font, mm -hmm. like quote here in a different font. So some foreword. We had looked at that. What is urban terror, which ran in several of the issues as kind of a set the tone, if you will. And then these are some of the comics that we looked at. This is your oversized first issue, but reduced to book size. And this is a pretty pretty good sized book too. I think it's bigger than the actual magazine editions, uh, just slightly. And I think it's organized by story. So, you know, you get mostly the GC story is what takes over after that first issue. Right. And it's nice because they have the real deal comic number down here of where the stories are coming from. Look at how that... That ain't Lawrence Hubbard. Yeah, you know what? I, I was just wondering that, because it doesn't look like him. Maybe he had an inker. It's possible. There are some other artists that rule through this series, and so maybe he was working with an inker there, but yeah, the finishing definitely looks different. The figures I, still look about right. I like it, because it, it has like um, S. Clay Wilson vibes to it or something. Still these unusual page layouts. You know, like, pretty yeah. great. That certainly looks like Lawrence. For sure. Lawrence Hubbard. Raw dog. <laughs> Just crazy characters. Look at that character. The hooded Mac. Mm -hmm. Good interviews in the back. Yeah. We're going to flip to that part. So this is uh, mostly GC and the R team is what's in here. I'm not sure Planet Dregs is in here at all. And then you see like the color reproductions of these covers. I love his color work. Slop burger. And this is what started the uh, collaboration. This is, it says Real Deal Publications presents Plantation 2000, but uh, this is pre Lawrence Hubbard. So these are comics by R.D. Bone. At one point, what happens, and this is all in here in the intro and in the interview, is that Lawrence Hubbard and R.D. Bone were working in the same place and realized that they both kind of draw and make little comics and stuff. And so this was a comic that R.D. Bone had made, and when Lawrence Hubbard read it, fell in love with it, and they start working together. That's cool, because, I mean, this is a step above the Harvey P. Carr script. Yeah, yeah, this is this is like a mini-comic, you know, like a real mini-comic. Right. It's interesting, too, he talks a lot about, you know, making this stuff while working, which I think a lot of alternative cartoonists can kind of relate to, and uh, there is the Planet Dreg stuff. So I think this might just be the Planet tregs the chapter or two that Lawrence Hubbard that's drew. All. That's all. So you get a little taste of it in this. This is a great collection for that reason. And then, of course, the Aftermatter. Look, they even reprint Power Bear ad. <laughs> How beautiful is that? Yeah, for sure. Then in the afterword here, it's an interview with Lawrence Hubbard. And he kind of goes through and he talks a lot about the genesis of this comic and the publishing history of this comic since they were self-publishing up until 2016 or whenever this book comes out. And it just goes through that whole process, talks about sending the issues off to different publishers to try to find a publisher and uh, would get great letters back. And they got a letter back with the Spider-Man on the envelope, so from Marvel Comics, and tore into it very excited. And the guy, it wasn't a form letter. The editor had taken time to write, like, this is amazing stuff, not 
what Mar Marvel doesn't have a place for it, but the editor did take time to return a uh, you know a personalized letter as opposed to the form letter that Marvel that, that I think we've all gotten. You read it and it's unassailable, but in the same breath, you can imagine that Mike Gold at First Comics is not going to approve this <laughs> and, and 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 hook you up with a monthly gig. Yeah, part of the reason I love this is that I've never seen another comic that looks like that. Yeah. But if you're publishing comics for profit, there's a reason they all look the same. Like, people are afraid to take chances and try stuff. I thought this drawing was really good. Uh, another example of just really good figure drawing. Like, that's such a natural leg over a leg, and even the foot being kind of turned up. Yeah, well, every time I look at uh, Lawrence's stuff, it, it makes me want to, like, try to loosen up a little bit. Like, I, I get so rigid and stiff with my stuff, and, and his he just feels really free with his art making. I think it creates a real liveliness of the characters. You know, that... I hate to say imperfections, but that loose quality does sort of create an animated feeling mm -hmm. with characters. Some background on them exhibiting a Comic-Con and how that was kind of this big moment. Uh, and then talking about some of the features like the art team and stuff. And this is Lawrence Hubbard here. Yes, it is, man. 2012. So pretty cool, man. You know, like... This is a very well done book in that it's fairly comprehensive comics wise, but then gives a lot more information on the comics itself, where it came from, how these dudes work, all the stuff that I love. You know, I had a lot of questions when I started finding real deal issues. This book really gets into those. We spend lots of time on this channel digging through long boxes at comic shops in the dusty bins. We come back with comics that we bought for a quarter and the good ones. We Google the names, and we read about the creators and try to find where the heck they landed, how did they end up, et cetera, and so forth. I sat on these real deal, these two, I just had the first two issues, sat on them for a long-ass fucking time, had no info, no info, no intel, never talked to you, like, never talked to anybody about the shit, because I just didn't even think anybody could even, maybe there were 50 of these things. Um, this is a pleasure, and, like, and getting to know Lawrence is amazing. You know what I mean? Being his friend on Instagram and Facebook and all of that shit and having ready access to talk some shit is dope, you know? So it's 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 amazing that something like this as as we've gotten into the game and we've we've grown with, you know, the comics medium like from from the inside at this point, books that I've been fantasizing about coming into existence have then come into existence uh, since I've been a pro, and this is one of them. Yeah, no doubt about it. And, you know, if you're watching at home and you're not familiar with Real Deal, uh, I would I would say, you know, if you're fans of Johnny Ryan's comics, if you're fans of Ben Mara's comics, like, give this a look. It's funny, it's violent, it's unique. Uh, you know, I think the drawing in some ways reminds me of some of Gary Panter's mark making and yeah. stuff. So there's a lot to appeal here, and I think there's quite a few avenues to come to this work. So if you're if you're seeing this, it's a fanographics book. You can track this thing down. Yeah, yeah, but you know you've been warned. You see you you've seen the little walkthrough and shit like that. We we show you what the deal is, man. So you can't be chicken hearted. No, this is this is humor for adults. So don't don't be mistaken on that. Yeah, <laughs> Jimmy, we got to get back to making some of our own comics. Why don't you hit them up with some plugs real quick? Octobriana, 1976, the world's first Blacklight comic, is live right now on Kickstarter, uh, but not for long. So pick that up while it's available now. I'm serializing my uh, Red Room comic, uh, gore snuff, outlaw <laughs> comics in the vein of Faust and The Crow, though it is considerably more gory than any Crow comic uh, you've probably ever read. Splatterpunk, is it safe to say? Splatterpunk. <laughs> Is anything safe to say in regards to Red Room? Gore grind. <laughs> fucking vicious, vicious comics, man. The blood is black as the ink that it was drawn with, man. And uh, three bucks gets you the archive. You know, serialized new pages every Tuesday. I also supplement uh, other back matter and behind-the-scenes sketches that I don't know. We'll see the light of day. Uh, sprinkle them in throughout the week. And uh, what else, man? Oh, of course, man. This is Cartoonist Kayfabe, so you got to subscribe <laughs> to the channel. You know, we're on that race to 20,000 subscribers. We hit 18,000 really, really fast. So let's hit that 20 mark really quick. And shit like this, this real deal. Fantagraphics didn't publish an infinite am amount of these books, man. So you got to hit that bell to mitigate that Kayfabe effect. You know, you want to get these books while they're at a reasonable price. 
and we seem to drive those prices up after we talk some shit, man. So you hit that bell, you, you get first dibs. Also, this book should be out of print. So uh, you guys go snatch these things up. You can uh, subscribe to the Cartoonist Kayfabe e-newsletter at the link below this video. You can pick up Cartoonist Kayfabe merchandise and t-shirts at the links below this video. Jimmy, I gotta go call Lawrence up, man. We need to schedule a motherfucking shoot interview ASAP. Give these dudes their marching orders. Read more comics.